Judy and I were really looking forward to Senior Saints in the Smokies this year. We have a lot of great memories from the Gatlinburg area. We honeymooned in Gatlinburg. We used to take our boys down to the Smoky Mountains for vacations. And we have a lot of respect for Johnson University. What a beautiful campus and quality faculty and a great education. But most of all, we have a deep appreciation for the Eubanks and the Weedmans and Tommy Smith and others here at the Johnson University. If ever there was a college that merited the support, the prayers, and the financial sacrifice of the people in the restoration movement, this is that university. And I hope you'll continue to be behind it with your prayers and your support. Isn't it strange that God took something so small that we can't even see it with the human eye, and he brought the whole world to a stop? And I think that God used that pandemic to humble a lot of people and to remind us that the things of this earth are just sinking sand. And we need to be building our lives on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Let's just pray that God will use this whole period to bring about a spirit of revival and repentance and renewal in America. In light of all we've been through and all the fears that people have had, I want to bring a message I'm entitling Overcoming the Fear of Death from the 23rd Psalm, if you'll turn in your Bible to that passage. Psalm 23, verse 4, and it reads like this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, the past six weeks or so, we have gone through the valley of the shadow of death. The corona pandemic has left a lot of people fearful. Some are just a little anxious. Others are absolutely terrified, afraid to come out of the house, afraid to touch their face, afraid to hug their own kids, afraid to shake hands or even touch a package. Let me ask you, are you afraid to die? Has the pandemic revealed that fear in you? I think some of you would say, absolutely not. I'm, my life is right with the Lord and I'm ready to go. Others would say, well, I'm not terrified of death, but I will have to admit, I've got a little apprehension. Woody Allen, the comedian, once said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. But many are very much afraid to die. And they're especially afraid to die of this coronavirus because uh, it seems to be an agonizing death, not to be able to get your breath, to be isolated in intensive care, your family can't visit you, or to be on a ventilator. And we say, I don't want to die like that. A Sunday school teacher asked her fifth grade class how many wanted to go to heaven. And everybody raised their hand except one little boy. And she said, Billy, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? He said, oh yeah, when I die. I thought you're getting up a busload to go today. Well, we Christians talk a good game about wanting to go to heaven. But the truth is, many of us have this innate fear of dying. Death is mysterious. We've never been there before. It's often very undignified and accompanied by a lot of pain. And it is counter to our instinct to live. Now, as in most fears, the fear of death is not altogether bad. The will to live, I think, is the strongest instinct that God has placed within our bodies. The innate fear of death prevents us from taking ridiculous chances or committing suicide or abusing our bodies with dangerous substances. And sometimes fear motivates people to holy living. They fear standing before God in judgment. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the Bible also says that death is the last enemy to be defeated. And the Bible also says that Christ came to release those who are held in lifelong bondage to the fear of death. It's one thing to have this innate will to live. It's another thing to live every day in bondage to the fear, to be paralyzed by the fear of death. A cardiologist in our church in Louisville waited a long time before he became a Christian. And one of the reasons he didn't become a Christian early on was he treated a lot of preachers who were afraid to die. When we have that kind of fear, it undermines our witness. 
Now when a man says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We need to sit up and take notice. Now, David knew what he was talking about. If ever there was a man who knew what it was to come close to dying, it was David from the time he was a young boy. When he was a teenager, David confronted the giant Goliath with no fear. 1 Samuel 17 relates that Goliath was such an intimidating figure. He stood over nine feet tall. Now think about that. Goliath was two feet taller than Shaquille O'Neal. And he dressed in this protective armor from head to toe. He stood out in the valley and challenged the Israeli army to send out their biggest and meanest to fight him one-on-one -on -one and win or take all. 1 Samuel 17, 11 relates, On hearing this, Saul... Now, King Saul, the Bible says, stood head and shoulders above every man. And if anybody should have been fighting Goliath, it was Saul. But Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And they all ran from Goliath in great fear. But out comes the teenage boy David to bring a lunch to his brothers on the front line. He sees Goliath taunting the Israeli army. And he says, I'll fight him. No problem. And King Saul protested, David, you're just a boy. Goliath is a massive, experienced soldier. How are you going to defeat a gorilla like that? And David responded, well, when I was tending my dad's sheep, I killed a lion and a bear. And the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from this giant, this uncircumcised Philistine. You see, David, even as a shepherd boy, had been in the valley of the shadow of death. Well, you know the story. David downed the trace talking giant with one sling shot of his sling and became an instant national hero. And he had no fear. Now, most of that is his confidence in God. I can't help but wonder if maybe David was a little bit cavalier because he was so young and death didn't seem to be a possibility. You know, when the coronavirus threat first came out, all the college kids, not all the college kids, a lot of the college kids went to Florida anyway, and you, they were interviewed and said, we have no fear. Well, young people think they're invincible and they can take any risk. They can try anything. And they don't worry about what's going to happen to them. But I've had some sad funerals of teenagers who thought that they could try any drug or they could drive drunk or they could ride wildly on a motorcycle. And the family discovers that life is a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. But David did not fear Goliath because of his strong faith in God. He was convinced that God was going to be with him. Well, he becomes this national hero, and it wasn't long before he had another close call with death. King Saul was so threatened by David's popularity that he tried to kill him because the women were singing, well, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Saul was so jealous that when David was playing the harp in the palace to try to comfort Saul, twice Saul tried to throw a spear at David and pin him against the wall. And David was quick in his reflexes ducked and barely escaped with his life. And King Saul then dispatched soldiers to go to David's home to arrest him and bring him in so he could be executed. And David's wife learned about it and helped him escape through a window. In 1 Samuel 20, verse 3, he says to his friend Jonathan, David, uh, Saul's son, your father's trying to kill me. And Jonathan insisted that couldn't be true. But David took an oath and said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only a step between me and death. Have you noticed this time doesn't, David doesn't seem quite as confident as he was in fighting Goliath. Saul was something else. And he wasn't so sure that he'd be exempt from death. And so he fled for his life. You know where he ran? He ran to the city of Gath. You know what's strange about that? Gath was the hometown of Goliath, the man he had defeated several years earlier in battle. But David fled to the Philistine territory thinking that these people would understand that he was an enemy now of King Saul and they would protect him. There's no saying, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But this is like 
Brett Favre going from the Green Bay Packers to the Minnesota Vikings or Coach Rick Pitino coaching at UK one year and then a few years later coaching at the University of Louisville. These are arch rivals. And David flees to the arch rival, to the Philistine territory, hoping that they would protect him. But the soldiers said to King Achish, this David is dangerous. He's the one they sing about in their dances that he's slain ten thousands. In 1 Samuel 21, 12 and 13, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. Sometimes we're courageous, and then other times we regress into fear. Verse 13 says, so he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. When his life was on the line, David became an actor. In order to escape, he pretended to be crazy. And the king dismissed him as a madman. And now for the next 10 years, David lives every day in the valley of the shadow of death, fleeing from King Saul and his soldiers trying to kill him. He hides out in caves and crevices of the rocks, knowing that there were enemies out there trying to take his life. 1 Samuel 23 says, Jonathan went to David and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. No wonder so many of the Psalms speak about facing death head on. Let me just read a few. Psalm 913, O Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death. Psalm 18, 5 and 6. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried out to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came before him into his ears. Psalm 55, 4 and 5. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Psalm 68, 20. Our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Psalm 88, 15. From my youth, I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and, and am in despair. Psalm 94, 17. Unless the Lord had given me help, I soon would have dwelt in the silence of death. And when I said, my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. And Psalm 141, verse 8. But my eyes are fixed on you, O sovereign Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not give me over to death. Well, David walked in the valley of the shadow of death for over a decade. Well, eventually he became king. He reigned for 40 years, and then he died as an old man. And 1 Kings 2.10 records that on his deathbed, David made some final arrangements. He placed Solomon on the throne. He advised Solomon and helped prepare for the building of a temple. And he gave instructions on how difficult situations were to be handled. And 2 Samuel 23.5 records David's last words. Is not my house right with God? Has he not made me with an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part? Will he not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire? Then the Bible says David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Now that's the man who says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now I want to share with you three lessons from Psalm 23 that should help us overcome the fear of death and be confident in death. Here's the first lesson. Face reality. Death is inevitable, so just make sure you're prepared for it. David did not pretend he was invincible. He confronted the reality of death. I'm going to walk in that valley. And when it came, he was ready. Some people will say of any anxiety, just put it out of your mind. Don't think about it. Well, that's impossible. I think just the opposite is best. Face your fear and ask yourself, when this happens, how will I cope with it? That means you prepare for it. You prepare yourself physically. 
Purchase proper insurance to protect your family. Make a will. Buy a cemetery plot. I found it helpful to write down the songs that I wanted to be sung at my funeral and the scriptures I want to be used. And a lot of people find it really helpful to make a prearrangement of their funeral, every detail of it, in advance. Now, when you do that, your family will say to you, well, I don't want to talk about it. And you can tell them, I don't have any immediate exit plans here. I just want to be prepared and avoid you having to make last minute decisions. We have a wonderful couple in our church, Doris and John Foster. And they had a neighbor lady years ago that they really watched over and cared for. Her name was Bernice Ely. And she had been a music teacher in the school system, but now she was nearing 90 years of age and living alone and getting more and more feeble. So they'd go over and take food and watch out for her. And she would say to them often, I, I just, I don't want to wind up in a nursing home. I, I want to be able to stay in my home. But finally she became so feeble that it was obvious that she she couldn't continue to stay in her home. And so they persuaded her she needed to go to the nursing home. And John went and made arrangements at a nursing home about four or five miles away. And when the day came, John drove a pickup truck and loaded all the furniture and belongings that she could have in this small room. And then Doris got Mrs. Ely in the front seat and drove her to the nursing home. And John followed in his truck. When they pulled into the nursing home, Doris looked over to see if Bernice was shedding a tear. And she looked over and she had died. She died on the way to the nursing home. Isn't that a perfect way to go? How does planning in advance maybe what, what you're doing? But I, I teased John that he probably went in and asked for the deposit back. I don't know about that, but most of us can't plan that perfectly. But planning for your death, facing the reality of death, will help you. Don't just plan physically. More importantly, plan spiritually. Hebrews 9.27 says, uh, It is appointed unto man once to die. NIV says it is destined for man once to die. And after that, the judgment. One of the primary reasons we fear death is that we're terrified of facing God when we know we've done so many things wrong. And we fear judgment. We fear being uh, punished in hell. And we don't want that. The cure for that fear is not to refuse to think about it, but to face it and to repent of sin and accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Hebrews 2 says that Jesus suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And then the next verse 14 says, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. When you understand that your salvation is not dependent upon your good works, but upon Jesus' death on the cross, and you trust him, you have no reason to fear death or judgment. Because when you stand before God, all your sin is going to be buried in the deepest sea, and he doesn't remember it anymore. So claim that promise of Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. It'd be a terrifying experience to jump out of an airplane with no parachute. But if you jumped out of a plane and had a parachute on, even though it was the first jump, you'd be terrified a little bit, but you'd also have confidence it's going to be a soft landing. And you have a right to be fearful of dying if you have no salvation in Christ. But once you've trusted Christ, remember the Bible says it is by grace that you are saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. But you know what? I encounter a number of Christian people who trusted Christ years ago, were baptized, but they're still terrified of dying. And I think the primary reason is they've lived a very imperfect Christian life. And they wonder, will God still forgive me even though I haven't lived up to what his standard has been for me? I grew up in a wonderful Christian home. At age eight, I gave my life to Christ, was baptized. And I remember that day feeling, oh, my sins are forgiven. I have the promise of eternal life. I was very confident and I felt brand new. But to be honest with you, that was 68 years ago. And I have committed a whole lot more sin and a whole lot worse sin since I was eight than I did before that. And if I'm not careful, I will hear the voice of the adversary in my ear saying, 
do really think God is going to forgive you when you've committed the same sins over and over and you've fallen so far short? Let me just share with you two or three scriptures that really bring confidence and reassurance to me when I'm tempted to think that way. One is Romans, the eighth chapter, verse one, that says, therefore, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say there's no condemnation to those who have lived a perfect life, but no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm in Christ Jesus because I got baptized into him many years ago. Another verse that really helps me is 1 John 3, 1. It says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. You see, when I got baptized at age eight, God didn't just forgive my sin by the blood of Jesus. He adopted me into his family. I became his son. Now, let me ask you parents, you grandparents, how many times will your children disobey you or disappoint you and they're still your kids? I've got two sons and they haven't been perfect. Do you have any idea how many times I've almost disinherited my kids? I'll tell you how many times. Zero. Zero. They're my kids. Now, I guess they could become so rebellious that I would disinherit them because leaving them anything is going to only compound their addiction. And I don't want to suggest here that God is an enabler, but God is your father. And he's a whole lot better, more loving, more merciful father than I am. And when you became a Christian, he adopted you into his family and you stand in line to inherit his riches. The other passage that really helps me is 2 Timothy 2, 12 and 13. It says, if we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful for he can't disown himself. Now look at that passage. We are saved by putting our trust in Jesus' death for us on the cross. But if we disown him along the way and we say, I changed my mind. I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm a Muslim. I'm not putting my faith in Christ anymore. I'm an agnostic. He'll disown us. But if we are faithless, we just stumble and fall. We say, oh, I still believe in Jesus. I still trust. He will be faithful to us because he can't lie. He can't disown his role as a father. That is so reassuring to me as an imperfect Christian. That's one of the reasons I like that one stanza from the song, It Is Well With My Soul. It says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not the part, but the whole, not just what I did before I was eight, but the whole thing is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. You know what David says in the 23rd Psalm? Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So face reality, death's inevitable. Make sure you're prepared physically and spiritually. Here's the second principle. Be confident that God will supply the strength you need when death draws near. David said, I will fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. He knew when the time came for him to die, he wasn't going through that valley alone. God would show up in a special way and be with him. When you parents take your kids to a big concert or ball game, when do you give them the ticket if they're in grade school? When you leave the house? Not usually. You wait until you're at the gate and then you take out the ticket and give it to them. You have it, but you don't give it until they really need it. And I think the same is true as we face death. God shows up in a very special way. He supplies all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. In fact, 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, God is faithful he won't let you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll provide a way out so that you can escape through it. So rather than worry about death, we go through life confident. When that time comes, the Lord's going to lift me up. I tell you, I've preached for 50 years. And I have seen this over and over again in people that really surprise me. They get a notice that they've only got six months to live. They've got some kind of terminal illness. And I go to visit them and there are tears and there's sadness. And then they perk up and they say, you know what, I'm okay. And they start comforting the people who come to comfort them. And they have a, a supernatural strength within that only comes from God. The Holy Spirit comes and they can say, 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. God doesn't want you to live your life apprehensive every day about some virus or the potential to die. He hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but of confidence in him, not ourselves. And that means we can live every day in the precious present, regardless of the threat. In 1948, C.S. Lewis was asked how Christians should live under the threat of the atomic bomb. And his answer is lengthy. I'm going to read the whole thing because it's so good. But it speaks volumes to us living under the threat of a pandemic. Listen to what he says. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I'm tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year. Or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night. Or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, or an age of syphilis, or an age of paralysis, or an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love are already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented, and a quite high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had, indeed, one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics. But we still have that. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. Lewis goes on to say, This is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we're all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, battling, uh, <laughs> battling the, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint. Wish he hadn't said that. Chatting over to our, with our friends and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies. A microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. Amen. The Bible says God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Live confidently in the precious present, believing when death comes, you need not fear because he is with you. Here's the third principle. Increasingly set your focus on the eternal and less on the temporal. I will fear no evil because I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, David was confident there was something better waiting for him in the future. I used to teach a Saturday morning men's Bible class. And I had a lesson one time on death and dying. And I said, how many of you guys in this room are over 70? A bunch of them raised their hands. I said, as you get older, do you fear death more or less? They all said, oh, Bob, you fear death less as you get older. I said, why is that? And Bush Dabney said, it's because I got more friends in heaven than I got on earth. Fisher Jones, who was, I think, 92 at the time, said, you know, Bob, I actually hope I die pretty soon. My friends are going to think I didn't make it. I think that's the kind of attitude we ought to have toward death. There's something better waiting for us. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your affections on the things that are above, not on earthly things. And one of the things that this pandemic has done is to show us the futility of putting our faith in earthly things, be it sports or the economy or politics or the government. It's all sinking sand. But the Bible says, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, and I go to prepare one for you. Now think about that. I've got a room reserved in heaven where I'm going to spend forever and ever. It's got my name on it. It can never perish, spoil, or fade. And not just a room for me, but there are many rooms. There are going to be those people in heaven. You're going to meet fascinating people in heaven. The Bible says in Revelation there are going to be so many people there you can't count them all. Maybe your best friends in heaven are going to be people you've never met on earth. 
And there are other rooms. I picture a worship room where we go in and we hear this angelic choir that thrills us and Noah gives a testimony and, and uh, Gabriel plays a trumpet and, and uh, uh, David plays the harp and then Jesus walks out with a Bible and he starts showing us things in the Bible that were there all the time. We didn't see them. And we're going to be like the two on the road to Emmaus when it's over saying, wow, didn't our hearts burn within us when he opened us the scriptures? I think there will be an instant replay room in heaven. You can go and you watch any event in history exactly the way it happened without any revisionist history. Wouldn't you like to look back and see the whole ministry of Jesus, that three-year period, and see how it compares to what you imagined it to be? I'd like to go replay my life. I'd delete a few parts, but I'd like to look back and see how many times the providential hand of God was on me and I didn't even know it. I think there'll be a recreation room in heaven where you go sign up for golf trips and fishing trips and sightseeing tours. I think that God hasn't created this vast universe so one guy in Arizona can look through a telescope and find a new star. I think there'll be interplanetary travel in heaven. There'll be so many things to see and do. It'll take eternity to see and do them all. Sometimes people say, well, that's pretty fanciful. Well, maybe so. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says God is able to do more than we imagine. I think there'll be a question and answer room in heaven. You can go in and have all the questions you have here on earth answered for you. Some people think when we die, immediately we're going to know everything when we get to heaven. I don't think so. I think we'll have a greater capacity to learn. And I think we're going to spend eternity learning more and more about the greatness of God. In fact, in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 7, the Bible says, In the coming ages, he will show the incomparable riches of his grace. And that word show in the original means to reveal in an ongoing progressive way. I think we'll spend eternity learning. Heaven is not going to be a place where we sit on a cloud strumming a harp and we're bored to tears. There are going to be so many things to do and so many people to meet and places to go, but most of all, so much to learn, learn about the Lord Jesus Christ and God's plan of salvation. Get your mind off this world and onto the world to come where you're going to spend eternity. And then death is not so fearful. Let me close by telling you about something that happened to me six, eight months ago. Andy Potts of our church, a friend of mine, asked me if I would be his guardian on an honor flight. Now, you're probably familiar with the honor flights that were started in 2004 to pay tribute to World War II veterans who did so much for this country. You talk about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Those guys did so that we can be free. So they said, before these guys all die off, even if we have to take them in wheelchairs, and even though they're feeble in their 90s, let's fly them to Washington, D.C., let them see the World War II memorial, and then fly them back the same day. Just let them know they're appreciated. And everybody has to have a guardian. So I was Andy's guardian. We went out to Louisville Airport, 6 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't get over it. There must have been 40 volunteers there to help them with their paperwork and help feed them breakfast and tell them thank you for your service. There was one woman dressed up like Rosie the Riveter uh, going around meeting guys. There was a girls' trio there dressed up like Wax, a women's army corps completely the hats and the hairdos and the seams and their stockings, and they would sing these World War II era songs. They're just doing everything to make these guys feel special. And I was impressed that Heather French Henry was one of the volunteer guardians. Now, she was a former Miss Kentucky and Miss America, but her dad was a disabled vet. She has a heart for veterans, and she's gone on 10 of these trips volunteering to be a guardian for somebody who doesn't have a guardian, being with a guy, pushing him in a wheelchair, sometimes 12 hours a day. I said to Andy Potts, the guy I was with, I said, can you imagine coming out here, not having a guardian, and you're assigned Miss America? He said, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have invited you we get on a plane, and I'm telling you, flags, American flags, patriotic music. We fly to Washington, D.C. and get off at the gate. There's a barbershop quartet singing old-time songs and a guy running around in a yellow zoot suit. We get on these luxury buses. They've got police escorts with lights and sirens taking them through the traffic, treating them like kings. They go to the World War II memorial, and they spend about an hour there looking things over. Then they sit down to rest. And while they're resting, the girls' trio starts singing some of their favorite songs. 
And there's this old guy in a wheelchair who raised his hand after a song and said, do you know such and such a song? Obviously his departed wife's love song. And one girl said, I know it. And she stood there and she sang that song to him. And I'm telling you, tears were streaming down this weathered face. And then she leaned over and gave him a kiss. It was moving. They took them to the Vietnam Memorial and the Korean War Memorial and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It was a great day. We fly home. Everybody is exhausted. We get back to Louisville about 9.45 at night. And they think it's over. But not so. The best was yet to be. When we came through the gate of Stanford Field, I'm telling you, there were 2,000 volunteers from Louisville to greet these guys and welcome them home. There were former military men saluting them as they came by, shouting, thanks for your service. Little kids held up signs, thank you for your service. People pat them on the back. These guys, many of them weeping as they go through this line of people. And I thought about heaven. When that day comes that our spirits depart from our bodies like a hand is removed from the glove and to be absent from the body is immediate presence with the Lord and we're greeted by his nail-scarred hands and we get to thank him for his death on the cross that saves us. I think the Lord is going to say to us, now just beyond that gate there, there's some people ready to welcome you home. And the gate opens up and a vast cloud of witnesses are going to be applauding. People you never even met that your life impacted in some way are going to thank you for your service and welcome you home. Don't miss that for the world. But focus on that rather than the things of this world. The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.